report, even though I have no idea if my computer is cooperating or not. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll find out when we try to upload it to YouTube or not. Um, we're, we're kind of nearing the end, um, as you probably figured out, because it's May 5th and we go through May 19. So that gives us today plus two more. And we've been looking at how to live into a new reality if, if the gospel is true, and it is. And one of the effects of the gospel is that Jesus not only deals with the problem of our um, sin and guilt, but also the problem of our shame, then it follows then that because of what Jesus has done for us, we should be able to live into a reality in which the effects of shame in our own life are, um, part of me wants to say eliminated, but I think that's maybe an other side of heaven reality, if that makes sense. But, but we increasingly, I think, learn to live free from that. And so we look first at how do we do that individually? How do we do that in our personal lives? And one of the things that I suggested is uh, incorporating the practice of repentance and the practice of sort of acknowledging past sins and, and maybe, well, past, but also just kind of ongoing. In other words, being able to live into that freedom of naming and confessing our sins to God and then being reminded of the assurance of his grace and forgiveness. And that's one of the things that, that is quite healing and helpful. And then we talked about um, how do we live differently in our relationships. And by that, I in some ways, there's overlap between that and what we're looking at now, but when, I, when we talk about relationships, I focused mainly on marriage and family, although many of the things that we talked about there can expand quite nicely out into all kinds of other relationships. Uh, today, we're going to start in what I think is the last area of, well, yeah, well, it is. It's the last because it's the last one we're doing, but there's maybe others as well we could look at. But we're looking at what does it mean to be a Christian community that lives more and more into this reality where we are set free from the from the power of shame. And um, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to put Michael or Kim on the spot to explain the pottery there. But um, what we're looking at here is how do we, how do we practice redemptive living in community? How do we live free from, how do we be a church community that experiences freedom from shame? And I've got a few things that I, that I think apply here. And by no means is it exhaustive, and so I'm hoping that others of you will maybe fill in some blanks on this. But I wanted to, I wanted to open with a few words from Mark chapter three, and this is one of these. I find this fascinating. It, it, it's a story that is sort of like you wish you could be a fly on the wall. I'm just going to read it, and then I'll make a couple comments about it because I think it introduces this theme. And his mother and his brothers, that's Jesus, Jesus' mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And, um, in, you know, in part, I'm just so curious about how that must have looked because, you know, here's Jesus is at that point where he's saying and doing things that are so out of the ordinary that it's drawing a crowd and it's drawing a crowd and it's, and it's sort of putting his family in that spot of feeling almost like maybe shame, if we want to use the language that we've been looking at, because Jesus is, is, putting their family in a bad light and in a first century shame honor society, that's a big deal. Like when one of your family members goes rogue, it's all even today, that's not a good thing. But back then it was even worse. And so there's this concern that the family has, like we've got to rein in Jesus because he's really, he, you know, he's saying things that really make us all look really bad. But what Jesus responds with, how he responds to that is by really by saying that he's come to redefine the whole idea of what family is all about. In other words, he's saying true family is 
those who do my will, those who are brought into relationship with me. I think another way to say that is, 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 is to point out that what Jesus came to create when he creates the church is not just people, not just people in a place to do religious things, but he's come to create a new family. The church is meant to be a place where we have that sort of deep relationship with one another in which we can be open and vulnerable and transparent, but also to encourage each other, to weep with each other when we are weeping, um, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and so on. And so there's this, this whole, you know, you know the, the depth of what Jesus intends when he creates his church, I think, is already beginning to see, be seen there in Mark chapter 3 in the early parts of the gospel. And so our question then today becomes, how do we live as that family? How do we, how do we practice that sort of relationship? And, and I'm going to suggest that this does not mean that we pour out our deepest, darkest secrets with everyone in the family, because you wouldn't do that in your own family, I suspect. You probably have people in your family that you'd say, well, you know, Uncle Rico, if you've watched Napoleon Dynamite, uh, Uncle Rico is probably the one we're not going to talk to about certain things. But but here's, you know, Aunt Susan, and she's a great listener, and I can trust her. And so how do we do that as a church? That's what we're going to really get into over the next um today and the next last two weeks as we kind of wrap this up. But before we get into that, let's let's pray together. Let's ask that God would bless our time together. Father, we thank you that you did come to create a new family, a family whose ties run deeper than just blood, but also ultimately that are tied together in you. And um, what, a, what a picture that is of, of your redemptive power and what, what hope that gives to us. Father, as we spend some time today and even over the next couple of weeks exploring this more, more deeply, um, I'm praying that you'll help us to learn what it would look like for each of us to practice that in our own lives and how we can do that as, as a church, how we here at Sunny Slope can, can cultivate this sort of community. So guide us in that direction, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, so Michael or Kim, you can say no, but... If you don't, would you be willing to explain that picture up there? This is, I'm not just singling Michael and Kimo. This is Japanese pottery. So putting you on the spot, would, would some of you explain just a little bit what we're looking at there on the screen? Or if you want to say no, just say no, and I'll try to explain it my way. This is a thing that is done with uh, valuable pottery that is broken. And um, instead of just throwing it away, or instead of trying to seamlessly mend it, uh, with glue or whatever, which never fully works and just makes it look like it's a broken thing that was mended, right? <clears throat> Mending it with gold is a way of, I mean, it, it actually increases the value of the piece and the broken piece. So it makes it yeah. adds to the beauty. Yeah. So it, it and at the end it becomes more valuable, more valuable than if it had not ever happened. And it's called kintsugi. Yeah. Am I saying that sort of in the ballpark? It's called, probably American, but yeah. I, 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 I in Japan is always the vowels are always the same way. So it'd be like like Japanese. I'd okay. Be like uh, like Spanish. Oh, okay. So keen, keen is gold. Keen kintsugi. Yeah. Okay. Um, now. This is not my analogy. This is something from Kurt Thompson. You've heard me reference his name a couple of times in our time together because he's written some, he's the neurobiologist who has written quite extensively about spirituality and, bi and neurochemistry. His books are really good if you're interested in kind of that intersection of the, you know, brain neurons and chemical components of the brain and how that impacts us spiritually. But one of the things he wrote, he did write a whole book on the topic of shame. And he starts off by, by, talking about kintsugi as a picture of what the church ought to be. In other words, broken people, like the church is not a collection of people who are, you know, perfected pottery altogether, right? We're all broken people. We come with stuff that has hurt us in the past, but also our own sins and weaknesses and struggles. And what God wants to do in the life of the church is to sort of bring us together and through our brokenness, working through our sins and weaknesses and struggles and brokenness, create something that is more precious and more valuable than if it had not been broken in the first place. Does that make sense? So, so he uses this as a picture of what the church can look like. And the whole book describes some of the practical ways that a person 
or, or a church might practice that. Now, my, my critique, this is just a little side note, my, my, I, I, maybe it's not even a critique, it's a, more of a thought. It, he, he describes the practice of what we would call small groups in which people get into the habit of sharing and listening to one another. But his way of doing it, he even comes out basically and says, you, know, you really need a licensed psychologist to do this because of the depth and vulnerability involved, which on the one hand makes a lot of sense. And on the other hand, I, it sort of started my thinking of, well, that's great, but that limits it, right? Because how many churches have seven or eight licensed psychologists on hand who can invest the time and energy to make this happen on a church-wide thing. So I, then I thought, well, what would it look like for the church? How, how could you maybe modify this a little bit so that you could practice it in the life of the church? I don't have a good answer to that yet, um, but it's just kind of been something percolating in my mind. Small groups practice some of that, but I'm not sure that they go to the, well, I'm sure that most of them don't go to the depth that Kurt Thompson describes because the stuff that he unpacks is pretty, you know, some of it gets pretty personal, but um, but I, I think the point still holds. I think he's got an excellent picture of here what the church is like. Now, let's talk a little bit first about why this doesn't always happen. And one of the big things is people tend to be judgmental, right? And let's be honest, the church sometimes has a reputation for being a little judgmental. Am I alone in thinking this, or is this something that you'd all kind of agree with? That at least broad brush, churches can be places that are very critical and and judgmental. Now, I say that, but there's some good reason behind that. And that I'll just I'll just give you an example. So um, human sexuality is obviously a big topic in our world today. Suppose you have a well, I'll, I'll say it a little bit a little differently. Alistair Begg came out a few a couple months ago and he made a statement. He was answering a question, should I go to my granddaughter's same sex wedding? And he gave an answer that basically said, well, you have to look at what does it mean to love your granddaughter, and maybe in this case that would be fitting. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying anything pro or con on that. I'm just, uh, that's waters. I'm not even, I'm sort of like dipping my toe in there. I'm going to quickly pull my foot back because I don't want to get way too far to that. But here's, here's the question that came out of that. Um, what does it, what, where is that line between um, approval of something and just, living into a broken reality. In other words, if you go to the wedding, are you approving that and accepting that? Or are you just saying, listen, I'm here to love my, my neighbor? Now, that's a complicated question. One of the things that the church often deals with is if I'm in relationship with someone and if I'm sort of developing a friendship with them and they share their vulnerability with me and I don't say anything about it, if I don't, if I don't voice my opinion on that, am I accepting that behavior? Am I approving of it? And some people would say, yeah, you are. So you have to speak up. You have to say something. And so then the next thing is, well, Christians tend to want to actually speak. And, and we're called to do that, right? We're called to speak prophetically. We're called to speak the truth. We, talk, we looked at that verse last week, and we're looking at it this morning in church in Ephesians chapter uh, uh, 5, where it says, expose the, the deeds of darkness. So, so we're called to speak truth into the darkness of this world, but sometimes that comes across as judgmental. And so we as Christians, we live in that tension of how do we, how do we speak truth? How do we represent the truth? How do we make it clear that, you know, we don't approve of this, but how do we also be a loving community? That's, that's a, a, a temptation. And so, and we haven't always lived into that very well. And so as a result, um, the church sometimes is, sometimes rightly, and sometimes I would say unfairly, is labeled as a judgmental community because people sometimes just want the church or other people to just approve of everything. Don't, you know, just love me. Just tell me that I'm good, right? And, and well, we can't do that, but sometimes we're harsh with the truth. And so there's, it's kind of that murky, muddled waters where it's not always clear how do we do this well. Does that make sense? You kind of, you kind of get the tension that I'm trying to describe here. Yeah, Michael. I was listening to a pastor from Africa talk about relations with the West and he said mm. people in North America know how to speak the truth but they're not loving. Yeah. And yeah. we in Africa are very loving but we struggle with yeah. speaking the truth. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's hard to know it's really hard. It's in yeah. culturally what's appropriate yeah. for how people <clears throat> would take it. Right. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good way to put it. Now here's here's this is this is food for thought. The, 
the culture as a whole, I think, is almost the opposite of it in, in North America, right? Because our culture is all very much about love and acceptance and tolerance. Although there are some really clear limits on that too. But, but truth is very subjective and squishy and it's your truth and it's my truth. And so it's, it's really weird. And, and you're right. I mean, I've seen that too. Like, like you've heard it from my colleagues overseas. Um, you know, yeah, they see that, that North Americans aren't always so gracious in how they present that. Um, so it, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. Now here's here. What does that look like in terms of being a community that is called to practice this work? One of the things that we have to pay attention to is that one of the reasons behind being judgmental, one of the reasons that we can step on our soapbox and look down on people and be very condemning. Um, in other words, when, when we practice this in the wrong way, one of the things at play is that we, we can seek our righteousness in being right. Does, does that make sense? You, you get what I'm saying? Like, if we make my position, whatever the, whatever the issue is, if my position is my righteousness, then I'm going to stand up on that and I'm going to look down on you if you disagree with me. And as Christians, I think, we, and, and I think, I think this is probably true, that this is probably a greater temptation among more conservative Christians, whereas I would say something different if it were more progressive Christians. You, you kind of get what I'm saying. Conservative Christians tend to make their doctrinal positions, their ethical positions, their theological positions, their source of rightness where, you know, I'm going to look, I'm going to stand on this and look down on you. Now, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that uh, orthodoxy is a bad thing. It's a wrong thing. I'm not saying that we should not care about that. That's, please don't take that away from this because that's not what I'm saying. I think it matters very, very much. But the, temp the, the temptation behind idolatry is always to take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, right? And so my doctrinal position on whatever issue it is, I believe this, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm better than you. And that's when the judgmentalism begins to creep in. Do you, do you kind of see how that works? Is that any pushback or thoughts on that? I just, I just kind of want to illustrate how I think this works because I think that will kind of help us then fight against what does it mean to be a vulnerable community on this. But questions or reactions to that, first of all? Kind of makes sense? Oh, yeah, and I agree that way. I used to be that way, and it's exactly yeah. just... Standing on, uh, well, when I first became reformed, just, you know, those are so important. To yeah. Me. And I and I really can relate to the tension, too, that you're describing, because yeah. then it seems like I swung it from a right. problem, swung it. That's right. I wasn't able to, to speak truth when I needed to. That's so right. Finding that balance is really hard. Finding it is really hard. And if we haven't wrestled with the tension, that almost makes me more like, oh, you haven't, you haven't really realized this is at play yet. So, um, and, and you're right, too, among... Reform people. I've seen it, and I have colleagues like this, and I, I tend this way myself. So I, you know, sort of one of these <clears throat> takes one to know on things. But yeah, you're right. Among conservative reform, there's sort of that um, mindset of we need our theological position, and and there's a risk and a danger there. Orthodoxy is important, but how do we not make it into an idol? Yeah, David. <clears throat> These days, people refer that to that as the cage stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you have heard of cage stage reform people? So if you haven't, people who are, some people say, well, you have to go through, well, they don't say quite like this, but you go through two conversions. You become a Christian, and then you become reformed. And then, you know, then you've seen the light, and then, you know, but those are, cage stage is sort of like saying, you're so reformed and you're so passionate about it that you need to be locked up in a cage a little bit until you can learn to settle down about it a little bit. Um, it's not my language. It's not David's language. It's R.C. Sproul's stuff. You know, he he first used that term. I think it was him. I first heard it from him, and uh, and I've seen it in in people. I went to college with a bunch of them. Um, Amy was there. You remember a few of the a uh, few of the people we went to college with with who were very reformed in their thinking. They could quote you John Calvin left, right, center, up, down, backwards, and forwards. But boy, if you didn't agree with them, they would hammer. They would literally hunt down people in the hallways of the dorms to correct your theology. That's my cage stage. My roommate and I were kind of guards when we saw them approaching a question. Yeah. We we actually read like you had to go hang out with us. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it was it was bad, and and now I'm not saying churches do that now too much, but but the temptation is there now. Here's a couple things to think about in terms of this whole idea of, of how does this fit in with shame. 
we tend to be, and this is, this is, by the way, this is not my thought, this is Brene Brown's stuff that I'm importing here, but she, she points out that she says, we tend to be judgmental on the things that we are vulnerable with. Does that make sense? So we, now, we're using theological position here, but this is very broad. I mean, you know, morality, anything. The things that we personally feel like we struggle with, those are the places that we tend to be judgmental of others on. And so if it's, you know, you can use anything. If you, if you are, you know, if, if your diet, meaning, you know, you don't eat certain kinds of foods and you're a health, you know, a big health food kick, um, if it, that can become sort of your righteousness in a way, right? Like I'm, I'm look at me, look at how good I eat. And then you'll be, you walk through the grocery store and you look into other people's shopping carts. And in, you, if you won't say it out loud, probably, hopefully, but you will think it, you'll be, oh, look at that person. You know, look at all the ramen noodles they're putting in their cart and look at all that processed food and I'm better than them, right? And because you're, you are vulnerable on that issue and you'll look down on other people who, and, and then here's, here's the other thing. Here's the other part of that. The other side of that coin is we are most judgmental with people that we perceive as inferior to us, right? So, so, um, so we tend to look well, obviously down on, uh, uh, we, use, we pick the issues that we are personally that, that we're sort of drawn to or we're vulnerable on. And then we, we judge people who we think are doing worse than we are. And we do it because again, we're, we're trying to establish our righteousness. We're trying to prove that we are something special and good and, and acceptable and worthy. So you kind of see the relationship there between shame. We're trying to overcome our shame by establishing our worth on, um, on whatever the issue is in, in our rightness. And so we become a judgmental community. Now, how do we fight against that as a church community? What are some of the things that, and maybe I'll just open it up to you. What do you think? How do we as a church overcome that, uh, that temptation or that weakness? What, what are your thoughts on that? We become more aware of our own sin. Yeah, right? More definitely. aware of our desperate need for the grace of God in Christ. Right. And that we all have that in common. Exactly. That's exactly. exactly. That's what we're all, all of us have right. to share that. Exactly. I think it was Carl Henry who said that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, right? So we have to be constantly reminding ourselves of that, that, look, the gospel is all about broken people needing Jesus and finding in Jesus what only Jesus can give. So I have, I have nothing with which I can look down on anybody for. Now, there's, Satan will try to tell me otherwise. But to fight against this problem of shame means acknowledging and recognizing, no, I'm just as broken as everybody else. My, my weakness might be different. Like, like, you know, to come back to the temptation or the issue of human sexuality, because that is such a big one. Um, you've heard me say this before, or hopefully you've heard me say this before, that every single human being struggles with sexual brokenness. And so now it's going to look different for some people, right? Some people will struggle with homosexual attraction. Some people will struggle with pornography or lust or whatever else. But, but we're all on the same page in the sense that it's a struggle for everyone. And so if we're going to speak into this issue as a church, and I think we have to, but we have to do it from that perspective that says, I'm no better than you just because you might struggle with that, and, and just because your sin might be more evident and obvious, um, we're, we're partners in this. We are, we are, we're walking this same road together. So how, how can you encourage me, and how can I encourage you towards godliness? And, and that starts in what you just said, Melissa, which is we all recognize our brokenness. Any other thoughts on this? What strikes me is how similar this is to small children in their own lives and playground, like, I want to be better at this, but I'm going to yeah. pick on this person that yes. isn't as good at it as I am, even yes. though I'm not really good at it. So I look a little better. Yeah. So if that's something that we really start putting efforts, yeah. not just as a few people here and there, but as a large community, putting effort into correcting that at a younger age, it then becomes yeah. easier to see that in other yeah. areas yeah, of yeah. our life and then apply that more thoroughly as we grow older and right. to everyone around us. Right. I, I, I think that's such a good point because this whole mindset of being judgmental does not, you know, it's not like you learn it when you turn 18, right? It's like you practice it when you're about three. <laughs> you already start seeing it come out. You know, I was I was picked on a lot as a kid. Um, I wish I could say it was this poor innocent victim, but I could look at my own life and say I could be just as cruel to other kids. It's like, you know, I should have known better, right? And you're, 
you know what it's like to be picked on, and why would I go out and and you do it because you want to? It's a totem pole, right? Yeah. Let me try to get I a little. Be the guy on the bottom. You're you're you you might be a little weaker than me, and if I can make you look dumb, and they're at least not picking again, on me, they're and they're not picking you. on me. Sure. Yep, I'm not exactly right. for five minutes. They're so no so right. So I love that idea of starting young and and mm -hmm. sort of impressing this upon kids right from the right from the get go. I think mm -hmm. that's that's right. Yeah, Adrian, you wanted to say something too. The manager is a person who has to take all the difficult questions. Mm -hmm. And so people outside of management, we shouldn't have to be under, we're not under any stress because we're not, make, we're, not we're not calling the shots. So we shouldn't have to experience any stress at all because we're not in charge. Mm -hmm. And so the manager has to, he has to be convincing in his arguments that his ideas are better than everybody else's. And so he has to organize his thoughts in his brain and, and he has to convince his friends, whatever, that his ideas are better. But that means he has to be convincing. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So you, you, we need a way to, be, to present the, the truth in a way that is winsome. So, so it's truth and grace. It's kind of what we came back to a little bit earlier. It's presenting the truth in a way that is winsome and compelling rather than harsh and judgmental. Good. Um, let me give you a couple of, of things. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things is cho being choosy in the people that you tell your, to whom you tell your story, right? So I think, I think we need to be able to talk to other people within the Christian community about our weaknesses and about our, our struggles and about our sins. I think that's one of the things that, that can, you know, can, can create this, this Kintsugi community is when you get broken people who are sharing with other broken people. Now, um, and, and so, but, but not everybody is, let's say, I'll, I'll, I'm going to use a word and then I'm going to qualify it. Not everybody is worthy to hear your story. Now, that doesn't mean not every, you know, you treat people as unworthy, but it, you know, and shame them because you're not good enough to hear my story. That's sort of the opposite of what we're trying to do here. But you need to be selective about, who hears what you need to share. You've got to just recognize there are some people that have the trust and the relationship that will allow for this. And that's because that's a pretty sacred thing, right? When you open up about your struggle, that's a very sacred, uh, that's a sacred moment. And you can't just pour that out to everyone. Uh, maybe you've seen people, and especially on social media, because that's made this so much easier, who just vent their stuff everywhere, right? If you all, if you're on social media, have you ever seen that before? Like you read a post from someone and they're just pouring it out. In my mind, usually that's an indicator of, um, th that's an indicator of something going wrong in terms of, it, it's usually a, it's a, at the worst, it's a cry for attention, right? It's a way of saying, look at me. Um, I need your pity. I need your sympathy and I need the attention. That's not really a genuine can I share my struggle with you and, and can we work through this in Christian community? That's more of a, I need, I need attention and here's a way I'm going to get it. So that I, and I realize that's, that's kind of harsh because usually people that put that stuff out are struggling, but I think, I think it's an in, that's usually what it's an indicator. So you have to, you know, that don't social media. No, don't, don't go that route, but think through who do you have in your life? Outside of your, even outside of your spouse, if you're a married person, um, who do you have in your life that you can open up to? Um, what, what friendships within the Christian community do you have? And, you know, for most of us, it's probably going to be only one or two people that you can actually share about. And, um, you know, you have to be even selective in how you share it in that. But I, I, I've talked to people who are struggling with some of the most um, personal and difficult now, I've got to be vague, obviously, and these are people even not within Sunny Slope, but, but people that I've met in, in the course of pastoral work. And one of the things that I've heard repeatedly is that um, their struggle is all the worse because they're so lonely. You know, I've talked to people who struggle with whether it's a sexual addiction or even gender dysphoria or those sorts of things. They will say, I just, I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And... And that to me is really hard to hear because it's, you know, 
the people who struggle with, especially these taboo sins of our culture, sexual sins, you know, same-sex attraction, you know what the climate is like in our church churches, speaking, you know, not just, I'm not necessarily speaking Sunday school, but just broadly speaking. So how, do, how you know, so if you're struggling with these kinds of sins, where do you go with that? And that's a hard question, because if you don't have anyone to go to, if you don't have anywhere to go to, um, you're walking it alone. And you are infinitely more likely to give in to temptation than if you have people that can walk along with you. And so even in my own pastoral ministry, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that simply involves a lot of times is just listening and learning to, to not, and, and you can do that. And that's, here's where that tension comes in, right? Because if I'm just listening, am I approving? No, I don't think I am. I mean, I, I in, in the appropriate time and place, uh, you know, I'll reinforce and reaffirm what the Bible says. But a lot of times, at least in my experience, people know that already. They don't need to be, they don't, they don't need to be told, what does the Bible really say about homosexuality? They already know that. What they need is someone who will walk with them and listen to them and check in with them and say, hey, how are you doing? And then to hear, hey, I'm really struggling today. It's been just a really hard week. And then you know, I can respond by saying, well, listen, I'm praying. Here's what I'm praying for for you. I'm praying that God will strengthen you. I'm praying that God will help you withstand the temptation. And I want you to know that I'm here for you. That's not approving of anything, right? That's not saying, well, you know what? Maybe you should just, maybe, maybe God made you this way and you should just indulge. It's not saying that. But it is saying, I'm here to walk with you and I'm no better than you. I, my sins might be different, but uh, it's no better than yours. So, so I think, you know, I think, I think we need to all f- ask ourselves that question. Do, who do you talk to? And in what settings do you talk to? Um, who's, who's earned the right to hear your story of, 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 of struggle? And who do you listen to? And are you committed to being a listener? So any questions to that? I'm, I'm just, maybe I'll pause and just allow for response to that. I don't necessarily have a question. To sure, yeah, just comment. From my own personal experience, um, people that have gone through similar situations, you know, like if they've been in the same trenches that you've been in, and they're on the upside and can help you get out of that trench and say, this is how I walked that, this is mm-hmm. what I've done, this is where I've gone. Um, yeah. they're, uh, they typically have, you know, one experience you can draw from. Yeah, right. Two, they right. know how to empathize with <clears throat> right, the struggle right, right, right. you're experiencing. Exactly. Um, I mean, and I think that there's people that have been through all sorts of different struggles, even that are struggles that are not mine. That you know, they can they can find and help people that are going through yeah. the same sort of similar struggles. I mean, That's people right. don't need to necessarily know. Uh, every detail, but I mean, if you can be at least open and honest enough about these are my struggles, yep. you know, at a, you know, an aerial view, and then people right. that have been there, right, right, can, good way to put know, come in and be like, right. hey, you know, I, I've struggled with that too, yeah. you know, can you help me, or can I help you? Excellent, that's great, yeah, I like, I like the idea of the aerial view, you know, like flying at 39,000 feet, and then there might be, you know, you can share that more broadly, but then, you know, there might be two or three people that you walk the highway with, right? And the highway is long and difficult, and, and the aerial view is like, you get a sense of it, but yeah, that's a great, yeah, Most Jessica. people that are in a similar struggle are going to hear that aerial view and think, aha, I know what that semi-vague yep. language means. This yep. is someone that has some credibility, and I can seek out and know right. that this deep shame that I'm carrying is going to be safe yeah. and revealed yes, to them yes. because I, I know that they're in a similar type situation or have been. Right. And they will understand where I'm at. Yeah, right. It's sort of it's sort of almost like a dog whistle, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. sharing things, not that you're trying to do it that way, but if you're sharing it, there's some language there and there that will immediately resonate with the person who's struggling with it. And then, you know, afterwards it's like, hey, listen, I really appreciate you sharing. Let me just tell you, I, I've struggled with some of the same things. And then you kind of, you know, go deeper there and that. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Yeah. Any other reactions? I'm curious if, if yeah, if you want to share a, an experience in which you've had this sort of redemptive community or relationship. I'm, you know, maybe you want to share that or other just general reactions to this. 
Well, it makes me hearing you talk about the just being a listener, good listener, and it really makes me want to be a more loving person yeah. that someone will come and, and I can listen. And I like that that you gave an example of how we could be a listener and and check you back in and praying, yeah. how we could pray specifically. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can right. do the work too. Right. Not trying to be the one that has to fix them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's an important point. The idea that it's God that is gonna fix or heal or strengthen the person, right? We we can be conduits for it, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's not our job to fix that person and, and there, there's an important difference there because again this is a little stereotypical but men tend towards that more right we tend to be fixers um you know and so if you you know if you've been in that situation and your wife comes to you and shares what they're going through and it's like you you know you got all kinds of good advice and it's like that's you know we had to learn and are learning and will continue to learn that you know sometimes it's just better to ask do you need me to listen or do you want some advice and um yeah, but also, yeah, the idea of God doing the work through us. Other thoughts or reactions? I also think that it's important to, like, come from, you don't know how those people got there. Like, you don't know their yeah. entire life story. Right. And a lot of the things that maybe we feel judgmental about uh, to realize <laughs> that we don't know how it might get up to that point. Right. And that um, if you haven't been there certainly not something it just exactly now i'm fishing for a marker and i'm thankful because you've given me the opportunity to use my marker and to draw um you know if you if here's a person's well let's do it this way here's a person's you know this is their life story and this is your life story Um, let's say this is the point they become a Christian and this is the point you become a Christian, but let's say they started in a much more tumultuous place than you did. Let's say they were raised not in a Christian home. They were maybe experienced a lot of abuse and brokenness and great amount of suffering. And let's say, you know, they've moved along and, and now they're still a little bit broken and messed up, but um, but but you become a Christian and you sort of make it till here. So you've become more mature. It's easy to look back on this person and say, man, they're, you know, what's the matter with them? They don't understand, you know, how to talk as a Christian. You know, they still swear a lot. They're whatever else. But you forget that while you've made a little progress, they've grown a lot more. It's just they started way behind where you were. And and it's important to remember that because in the moment, all you're seeing, you're, you know, you're just, you know, if you're just at this kind of point, you're you're seeing, or this point in time, and you're looking back and they're way behind you and you're frustrated and you're annoyed with them because, but then you remember, okay, but they've grown a lot more than you did. You had certain advantages that God allowed you that they didn't have. And it's not that you should feel guilty for having those advantages, but it is important to remember that you started with more than they did. And they've come further than you have. Yeah, they still have a long ways to go, but their race is a little longer than yours is. And, and that's important, I think, to remember. So, all right, um, we're gonna stop here because this is a good segue into next week. Next week, we're gonna, talk, we're gonna start talking about empathy versus sympathy. Um, there's a difference, and I think as a church, empathy is a better practice. Mm -hmm. Sympathy, maybe not so much. You know, we send sympathy cards all the time, um, which is okay, I guess. But as a, as a general rule, empathy is something better, and we'll talk about what that is and how to do that. But let's, um, let's pray together. Father, we're, uh, we're thankful that your Holy Spirit equips and empowers us to do what we've been talking about. To live as this community of vulnerability um, sounds really good on paper and in a classroom, but when we actually have to go out and share our struggles with another person, that's a whole other uh, that's a whole other experience. But you've promised us that your Holy Spirit will help us to do this, and so 
we're asking that you might show us maybe how we can put this into practice in our own lives. And then we're asking that you'd help us trust your spirit's leading in this. Be with us in the rest of our day together as we worship this morning and share fellowship with one another. Strengthen us in our walk and relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.